Well, we are we're ready to divulge, not reveal, but divulge the one thing that Peter, uh, the his letter, the first epistle of Peter relates to, and um, and of course some of you remember what I said, and that was. You know, that's why I said divulge it, because we're going to have to go through the scriptures and see it and see it and see it. And uh, but I'm going to give the simple answer and and a little bit of background. I will say that <clears throat> many of you have been um, very close or or in some cases sharing right along the lines of it, but not the fullness of it. And um, and again, when I share this first time. It may be easy for you to say, yeah, I knew that, but we're, we're going to look at some aspects eventually that will uh, really make this very, very, uh, you know, identifiable. I want to start, first of all, with a prayer that um, was uh, sent to me by Geraldine, uh, and I'm just going to have you, if, if you don't mind, to bow your heads and and I'll just read this as our prayer as we begin. Our Father, we hear your calling. Thank you for opening our hearts. We want now and will now come fully into Christ, our and your beloved firstborn. We hope all that is in your heart, Father, will come to pass in each of us. We believe you. You have set out the reality of calling. Christ in us, Christ the elect, Christ suffering in us, the only joyous sacrifice that pleases you, Father. O oh, Father, you fir your firstborn cornerstone, Jesus, is your foundation of your home. You have quickened us to be living stones filled with your Son's Spirit. Please build according to your pleasure, the perfect priesthood, in Christ, our head. All glory and praise and honor be yours. Amen, Father of lights. Amen. I don't know if you noticed, but that was a lot of um, quoting uh, directly from uh, 1 Peter. Okay, so what I want to start with <clears throat> is, first of all, I want to just read a little thing that I read to you before that was saying it's not this, it's not this, and, and then it has these aspects, uh, just, to, just to remind you of that. And then I want to go back over a few scriptures in, fir uh, um, in First Peter um, relating to uh, suffering. So... Um, <clears throat> So I, the, the subtitle of this when I <clears throat> excuse me, shared it with you before was, What kind of suffering is he talking about? And then I said, It is not the manifestation of the Lamb in daily things. Um, it is not his or our death on the cross. Uh, in fact, one of the things that we're going to see in, in his scriptures is that he's not really pointing to the cross, but he is pointing to death. Um, it, is, um, it is not his or our death on the cross. It is not generically Christ in us. It is us being with him in a specific way, and that's real key right there. It involves circumstances, it involves people, but more importantly, and of great, great importance is, it involves where we're at in relationship to him. Okay, so now I'm just going to go over um, <clears throat> a couple of scriptures from First Peter about the sufferings. Okay, um, and in fact, I'll just uh, I will state now uh, the word title for what this one thing would be. <clears throat> Again, many of you have set, used that, but you, you, you really were close, but you didn't really hit every point uh, that, was, that was trying to be put across here. So I want you to notice uh, sufferings of Christ or Christ's sufferings here. 
Okay, this is First Peter one eleven. Of course, uh, um, Jan read a bunch of these, and it was really good. Thank you, Jan, for the things that you shared, the scriptures that you shared, and the order that you put them in. Okay, First Peter one eleven. <clears throat> Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Christ, not the Holy Spirit, which was in them, did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. Okay. This is uh, 1 Peter 4, 13. But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory shall be revealed, you may be glad with exceeding joy. And then 1 Peter 5, 1. The elders which are among you I exhort who... Am also an elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Okay, and then just one that just mentions suffering but doesn't use the phrase sufferings of Christ or Christ's sufferings. And this is in 1 Peter 2 19. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience sake towards God, this is a this is conscience towards God, not conscience toward sin or not sinning or this is this is directly a heart thing and everything that we're going to be sharing really if you're going at it with the head tonight then you need to move to your heart <clears throat> for this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward god endure grief suffering wrongfully okay so my little statement here is, is that the sufferings of Christ um, as uh, understood by Peter was the fact that when Jesus was going through suffering or facing suffering, there was no heart in Peter to recognize where Jesus was at. And he, uh, I put, he wasn't with Jesus when he was facing suffering. He had no clue of how off he was. And we're going to read some of those scriptures that we've read before, but now we're going to read them in light of this. Um, so he, um, <clears throat> he wasn't with Jesus when, he was fa when Jesus was facing sufferings. He didn't really notice that he'd failed him in not fellowshipping with him in his sufferings until later, until um, after the resurrection. And then he saw it. And then sometime later, obviously, and then he wrote about it. So uh, one of the most uh, common scriptures that you and I are familiar with uh, concerning the sufferings of Christ is Philippians uh, 3, uh, 8 through 10. And I'm only reading this <clears throat> because um, I believe that what Paul refers to here is exactly what Peter and his epistle is about. And that we don't, we, do, we know everything about, you know, his death and we know the power of his resurrection and, and this and that. We quote the fellowship of his sufferings but I don't think we've really understood it. I think that we've had all kind of ideas of, you know, suffering somehow, and then, you know, Jesus suffered, and so I'm going to fellowship like that. This isn't just that, see? That's, a, that's an important point right there. <clears throat> it's not just that, you know, we're fellowshipping with his sufferings 2,000 years ago. It's that circumstances can relate to his sufferings and can relate to only coming about because of him and us being with him in that. So, uh, so listen to Philippians again, Phil uh, Philippians 3, 8 through 10. Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung. That has nothing to do with the sufferings of Christ right there. 
That doesn't. He's not. He hadn't got to that yet. Um, uh, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and do count them but dung that I may win Christ and be found in him, uh, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. All right. So even the conformable unto his death, I think that we're, we're looking at the cross. And I think that Peter is looking at the trial that happened before the cross. And I think it bears it out. He bears it out in his words that he, he's not, he doesn't point so much to the cross. He points to all the suffering that Jesus went through uh, in the trial <clears throat> and the beatings and all of that beforehand. All right, so um, and I wrote, <clears throat> it is the sufferings of Christ, uh, relating to Philippians here. It is the sufferings of Christ. Paul didn't want death. He wanted fellowship with him in his suffering. And again, he's not, he's not referring to 2,000 years ago. For us, it would be that. He's referring to in his walk and in his way when those seasons come up that he would be with the Lord. All right, so we, we, sh we, we get that a lot with Peter. And, and boy, all of y'all had some, some great scriptures and things. <clears throat> but we're going to go ahead and <clears throat> go through a, a couple of those. And I, uh, here's where I really ask you to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit and say, Holy Spirit, show me the, the, um, the heart of the Lord in these situations. And, and it would be like, show me the heart of the Lord in these situations where I can see, I, I can not be like Peter at that time, but like Peter now in the first epistle where I can see his, where he's at. I can see what he's going through. I can, I can identify with, I can identify that. And I can uh, not just identify with using my sufferings, but understanding that when it comes to those certain times, it is God-given sufferings of Christ to reveal Christ in us or to reveal that he's not in us in that way yet. All these explanations are the rest of the, the course. So, so, <clears throat> all right, so please listen and please try to focus in not on the, on the story or on Peter so much as on Jesus. Okay, so this is Matthew 16, beginning in verse 13. When Jesus came into the coast of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, he asked his disciples saying, whom do men say that I, the son of man am? And they said, some say thou art John the Baptist, some Elijah, others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. I mean, Peter could really hit the nail on the head but did he have the hammer? I mean, did he really understand it at that point? Uh, and Jesus answered and said unto him, Blessed art thou. Blessed art thou, Simon Barjona. There's something of pathos and of touch in his heart, in, his, in, his, in the spirit that he's at right now. Now, when this is going on and all that's going to follow, you'll see it all has that same pathos, that same thing of where Jesus is at and after this, where Peter is at, okay? Uh, For flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven, his Father, my Father. He didn't talk lightly, you know, well, my Father, my Father has revealed this to you. So uh, now verse 20. 
Then charged he his disciples that they should tell no man that he was Jesus the Christ. From that time forth began Jesus to show unto his disciples how that he must go unto Jerusalem and suffer many things, suffer many things of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and, and be raised again the third day. Verse 22, then Peter took him. Jesus is ready to go to the cross and die. But folks, he's facing, you remember, in the garden. So, but, but these are becoming realities. They're just a short, a week away or something from this. And um, if, I, if I remember correctly. But it's on him. It's on his heart. It's 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 he's he's bearing that reality. <clears throat> Suffer many things, and then Peter took him and began to rebuke him. Okay, now you're going to find in First Peter a man who was broken and yet. He finally got it, and he wants everyone else to get it. And there's an importance to behind Peter's sharing it uh, that is more than uh, information. This means so much to God. It means so much to God that to miss it can be dangerous. Okay? All right, so... He took him and rebuked him and said, be it far from thee, okay? So Jesus, you know, he's going to go to the cross. But it'd be nice if Peter was with him. It'd be nice if his disciples, when he finally starts sharing, okay, from that point on, doesn't it say that from that time? Yeah, from that time on, began, to Jesus, began Jesus to show unto his disciples how he must go to Jerusalem and suffer me. So now he's opening up and he's going, look, this is, this is where I'm going. This is, this is what I'm, I'm going to face. And Peter jumps up and starts rebuking him and taking him and says, be this far from you. Jesus doesn't need to hear, oh, no, don't go through that. Oh, no, no, pity. Be this far from you. You're, you're too important. You're too this or that. He needs someone just to be with him and say, you know, if that's, you know, if that's what you're going to do and that's what you're called to, but I, you know, I stand with you and I, you know, I, I don't even know the words. I mean, First Peter is going to explain it better than me. So, because he did go through this. And uh, it shall not be unto thee, but he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. He said to Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan. Okay? This wasn't a mild rebuke. This wasn't a Jesus getting upset and using terminology or word name calling that he shouldn't be doing. This is a recognition that, Peter, you're not with me in what I'm about to face. You don't even understand me then, much less are fellowshipping with me in these sufferings. Okay. Um, <clears throat> thou art, a, okay, so get behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense to me. You're an offense to me. See, the... To be with him in his sufferings is more than our little, I've said it, but more than our little sufferings and we're comparing them to his and saying, oh, I know what it's like. I feel I'm going through stuff too. It is not that. It's not even close to that. It's, and if we're not, we're an offense to him because we don't, and, and Peter truly was an offense to him at that point and at several other points along the way. Um, because the sufferings of Christ and the trial and all that that we have left out and we've only made the physical cross and not just the physical but the dying spiritually and taking upon sin that Paul talks so much about the issue 
Peter doesn't. He strictly stays within the confines of going through those sufferings. All right, so you're an offense to me. You know, um, uh, get behind me. Thou savorest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Savoring. You don't savor this. You're going through the motions of it. You've got enough theology to, to think that you're flowing with me, Peter. You've heard me share for three and a half years. You, you uh, can, you know, like um, who is Mary or Martha, uh, Martha, you know, oh, I know that, you know, there'll be a resurrection or whatever. Well, you know, I, we all know that because that's what we all focus on. But this is, this is big to him or Jesus would not be talking this way. And then Peter later on writes a whole epistle about it and says it's important to him. All right. Not, not so much us. It needs to be important to us, but. Um, then said Jesus unto his disciples, he turns to his, his disciples and says, If any man, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself, because that's going to be involved in, in 1 Peter. Um, Take up his cross and follow me. And I believe, I've come to believe, I can't prove it, and I, I don't know that, you know, I, I know you don't have to agree with me, but for the first time, I believe these words, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me, have to do with the sufferings of Christ, not the physical cross and going through the, us being crucified with Christ and all of that. This is what this, again, you don't have to believe this. But I, I, and I'll show you why I believe it. I do have some proof, the next scriptures that follow it. Um, but I believe that that's, this is where, part of where Peter got the idea of, oh my goodness, this, this is not just the cross. This is the sufferings. And does anybody remember anywhere where scripture, well, the prophets prophesied, da, 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 and the sufferings that would, anybody, anybody remember that? The, oh. We just go well in the sufferings because he died on the cross, but then he rose from the dead. See, and the prophets saw it. And they wanted to know what time and whatever about the sufferings. All right, so um, take up his cross and follow me. And so he's saying, you, you, this, is, this deals with your cross and that we haven't described that yet. Peter will describe that. Okay. And then he says, um, <clears throat> verse 25, And whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Okay. Most of you know that the word life there is your soul, soul life, shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. And here's proof now. Here we're starting to get into it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul? Anybody remember salvation of the soul? Salvation of the soul is a huge part of this process of, of Peter as, as he describes it in 1 Peter of going through these sufferings that are not really your sufferings. I mean, people may be accusing you, but you know that they are directly his sufferings of what he went through and of what he wants to go through in you and you be with him. Okay. If you're trying to save your soul, Peter saw that as that's exactly what I was trying to do. I was trying to save my soul. I was trying to avoid uh, uh, going through all that stuff. I didn't love him or know him enough to even think about his sufferings and being with him in it. And he said, but now, now that he's dead, now that he's gone, I can do that. I can do that. I can do that in his spirit. Okay, so... Um, uh, verse 26 for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his soul and Peter's going nothing um, or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul ok 
okay? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angel, and then shall they reward every man according to his works. Well, um, okay. Let, let's just try to sum it up a little bit here. Jesus is asking, who do men say that I am? Peter says a positive note, but then when it comes to his sufferings, he is totally out of whack with that. And so Jesus begins to rebuke him and rebuke him in real harsh terms and saying that you're savoring, you're, you're, you're just trying to get out of this stuff. And that's what happened later, which we'll read those scriptures too. Peter, when they, he just denied, he denied, he denied, you know, because he's just trying to get out of it. He can't bear it. Well, after, after that was over with, and then they got the Holy Spirit, he couldn't bear not having the Spirit of Christ and fellowship with the Lord in his sufferings while they're going on. Okay, so um, verse 27, For the Son of Man shall come in his glory with his Father. And so, Okay, so uh, he's going to judge every man according to his works. What works? If you seek to save your life, you're going to lose it. You know, what man does it profit if you gain, you, you gain the world by, you know, like Peter uh, denying Jesus, and you gain the world. In other words, you gain life in the world, but you're, you, your soul life, you're, you're, you, there has not come the salvation of your soul. Yes, Peter's a disciple, but he hasn't gained the salvation of his soul. Now think back to the Psalms. Come on, what we read, all of those. If you go back, if you have them in your notes, look at those verses. They all deal with this exact same issue. All right, so um, now let's go to um, uh, Luke 22, chapter, uh, book of Luke 22, verse 37. And this will be a little bit of a long reading, but um, uh, it's important that we go through these stories again with clarity and with a heart. Clarity meaning this is not about Peter. It's about Jesus and I need to tune in to him when I read this story now. And then once you tune in to him, and then you think about Peter, you are deeply moved at how Peter was just not in tune. Okay? Luke 22, verse 37. For I say unto you that this that is written must yet be accomplished in me. And, and he was reckoned among the transgressors. So this is what he's saying. This is written. I have to be reckoned among the transgressors. Okay. Now, He's come to do that again. He's determined he will do that. But you have to think of God, the sufferings of, as it were, if I can put it like that, the sufferings of God. Jesus was also God. The sufferings of God who had never sinned, never been in a sinful environment, never but until he came down here. And he's saying, I, I'm not only, you know, going to have a hard time down here. I'm going to be reckoned among the transgressors. For the things concerning me have an end. And they said, Lord, behold, here are two swords. So they figured out that, that Jesus is going to have to do some suffering, but they're still thinking in terms of, uh, we need, I need to be protected. That's what Peter was trying to do. No, no, I want to protect you from the Lamb Spirit. I want to protect you from the sufferings of Christ. I want to protect you from that. And, he's saying, and Jesus is saying, you savor the things that be of man, not of God. You, this is like Satan. This is offending me that you're this way. We had two swords. And he said unto them, it is enough. And he came out and went as he was wont to the Mount of Olives. And his disciples also followed him. And when he was at the place, he said unto them, pray, ye that, uh, <clears throat> pray that ye enter not into temptation. And he was withdrawn from them about a stone's cast and kneeled down and prayed, saying, Father, if thou art willing, if you're willing, Father, remove this cup from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done. 
Okay. This is the this is the suffering, folks. When you when Peter begins to describe it, um, you can you can tell that there are uh, there is the 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 uh, the soul that has to be dealt with. Jesus said that in the garden. Now is my soul troubled. What shall I say then? Father, save me from this hour, but for this cause came I this hour. Our soul goes crazy, and we don't want to go through this. And we don't. And the best thing we do is think, well, how unfair it is, and how bad all these people are. And we're we're not in tune at all. We're so wrong in our spirit, and we we think that we're just doing wrong in the thing i'm being sort of mordecai or Haman in my situation or whatever uh, when in reality this is an offense to jesus and it also i'll just say it like this i don't know if it's the best it hurts him because we're supposed to be the ones that are with him that know him that are in tune with him so verse 43 and there appeared an angel unto uh unto him from heaven strengthening him Okay, so the Father sends an angel since the disciples aren't there. Verse 44, and being in agony, agony, and being in agony, he prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was, as it were, great drops of blood falling down to the ground. And when he rose up from prayer and was come to his disciples, he found them sleeping. And um, and I, it says he found them sleeping for sorrow. I don't think it, that's re referring to the disciples there. I think he found them sleeping and somehow this is a reference to him sorrowfully finding them sleeping. Um, and, uh, and said unto them, Why sleep ye? Rise and pray, lest ye enter into temptation. And while he yet spake, behold, a multitude, and he that was called Judas, one of the twelve, went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him. Okay, so, uh, you know, say what you will. Jesus, Judas was one of his disciples, and Judas led the way to bring about the sufferings instead of being with him in those sufferings with him. Um, uh, and, and I read that and he was called Judas one of the twelve went before them and drew near unto Jesus to kiss him but Jesus said unto him Judas betrayest thou the son of man with a kiss when they which were about him saw what would follow they said unto him Lord shall we smite with the sword and one of them smote the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. And we know from other Gospels that that person was Peter. Okay, protective, protective. I'm going to protect you from the cross. I'm going to, but more than that, I mean, I'm going to protect you from the sufferings of Christ. Okay, um, that's that's the goal. That's it. That's what it's all about. I'm a good disciple. The proof of that is that I, I will protect you. Okay? And, um, and cut off his right ear. And Jesus answered and said, suffer, suffer ye thus far. And he touched his ear and he healed them. Okay, so Jesus in his mind and in his being is uh, has come to die to give himself he knows that crucifixion is going to be the way that it's going to be done okay uh, he knows that if he is and here it is here's first peter he knows that if he's going to glorify the father he's got to there's got to be as it were the salvation of his soul if you will Meaning, he doesn't go with his soul. His soul is saved. It's with him. It's of one heart and one spirit, on one mind with his spirit. Uh, he knows that that's got to be the case. So, when Peter pulls out a sword and whacks off the guy's ear, he, Jesus picks it up and heals him and goes, this is, he's not supposed to be suffering. If, any, 
If anybody else besides me is suffering, they're supposed to do it because they've entered into fellowship with me and mine. They're fellowshipping with me in my suffering. Okay. And then verse 52. I told you this would be a little bit longer reading here. Then Jesus said unto the chief priests and captains of the temple and the elders which are come to him, uh, Be ye come out as against a thief with swords and staves. Uh, when I was daily with you in the temple, you stretched forth no hand against me, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. Then took they him and led him and brought him into the high priest's house. And Peter followed afar off. And when they, had kindled, uh, when they had kindled a fire in the midst of the hall and were set down together, Peter sat down among them. But a certain maid beheld him as he sat by the fire and earnestly looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. Okay, now I want you to notice something here in verse, the end of verse 56 and the beginning of verse 57. The end of verse 56 says, She looked upon him and said, This man was also with him. Talking about Jesus. And he denied him. He didn't deny the woman. Do you see that? He, he didn't deny the woman. She said, you're, You were with him. And she goes, Uh-uh, -uh, you're wrong. He didn't deny her. He denied him, saying, Woman, I know him not. And after a little while, another saw him and said, Thou art also of them. And Peter said, Man, I am not. I guess that's where the saying, calling people man, you know, man, <laughs> I am not. And, and, um, and about the space of one hour, so this is an hour later after these first two people, two separate people, have presented the fact that Peter could suffer with Christ because he's, he's claiming Jesus' um, wounds, as it were. He's claiming Jesus' heart. Uh, he's being with him in this. Two separate people have said this, and then this one says, and, and about the space of one hour after, uh, one hour after, another confidently affirmed, saying, of a truth, this fellow also was with him, for he is a Galilean. All right, so now, you know, it is confidently affirmed that he is, and remember, these things will stick with Peter all of his life. They will form his theology. They will form his understanding of being with Jesus. They will form his relationship with the Lord. They will form just about every word of his first epistle. They will be the guiding compass of how not to be with the Lord. And that's what he's, that's the one thing. All right, so he says, um, in verse 60, And Peter said, Man, I know not what thou sayest. And immediately while he yet spake, the cock crowed, and the Lord turned and looked upon Peter. All right. All right. The Lord turned and looked upon Peter. What do you think's going on there? There's only one thing that really should be going on there, and that is that Peter realizes that he has royally missed this because the context is totally that. He has royally missed this and needs a little extra push with Jesus now to turn and look at him. Now to turn and look at him. Because that turn may be the thing that puts him over the top to be able to get this. Jesus' turn to look at him may be ultimately Peter's turn as he reminisces for some time after this. Uh, and looked upon Peter, and Peter remembered the word of the Lord, how he had said unto him, Before the cock crow, thou shalt deny me thrice. So, um, 
it says that he remembered the word not because he heard the cock crow, but because Jesus turned and looked at him. <laughs> I mean, And uh, verse 62, Peter went out and wept bitterly. Okay, now here's what I want you to notice. All of that denial, all of this stuff that went before this, because the stuff that went before this was they were sleeping. They should have been with the Lord. Uh, we remember that um, Peter uh, got rebuked by Jesus <clears throat> because instead of being there with him, in that spirit of let's go through this and let's glorify the Father, um, he's taking Jesus and rebuking him. So it all comes down to this, and, um, uh, and, and Peter has denied him three times, and Jesus has looked at him, and he goes out and weeps bitterly. Um, and then the next words are... Uh, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and, and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is this that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously spake they against him. All right, where's Peter? Peter went out. Peter went out and wept bitterly. Probably at that stage, it's still about Peter. Um, he didn't stand there and go, yes, I'm with him. Because that's when all this starts. Immediately when it says, that when, when, uh, and, and Peter went out and wept bitterly, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, struck him on the face. Just picture that going on to Jesus. All right. So, um, uh, so let me um, read one portion out of First Peter now, First Peter two, and uh, nineteen through twenty-five. <clears throat> so now listen to this in light of that. For this is thankworthy if a man for conscience toward God endure grief, suffering wrongfully. For what is it if when you are buffeted for your faults you shall take it patiently? But if when you do well and suffer for it you take it patiently, this is acceptable with God. Remember, the word do well and all of that has a different meaning. It's not that you're a good Christian. That's not what it's saying at all. It's saying that you take the slaps in the spirit of Christ. We'll see it. We'll, see, we'll go through all these. Um, um, when you do well and suffer for it, you take it patiently. This is acceptable with God. For even hereunto were you called. This is your calling. Because Christ also suffered for us. Now, notice the words suffer. He's saying he suffered for us, and of course we immediately see him on the cross, and I thirst, and you know, all that. But he's going to say it right out here. He's going to show what he's talking about, okay? Um, Christ suffered for us, leaving us an example. Well, okay, for, let's start with that one. Um, is he leaving us an example that we should die on a cross, and we should thirst, and we should, you know, cry you know, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? No, he's, there's an example being left to us by Christ's sufferings, and might I say in the trial and everything up to the cross, that we can enter into, okay? So, um, leaving us an example that you should follow his steps. So these are the steps through suffering with Christ is what he's talking about. Who did no sin, meaning he didn't do wrong. See, we always read this, that little phrase right there. Yeah, Jesus was sinless. 
It's not talking about Jesus being sinless. It's talking about in that trial when they're slapping him and when they're mocking him and when they're beating him and when they're whipping him and doing all of this stuff that he didn't sin because it's going to tell you why. It's going to tell you the, the process. Who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. I hope you see that that wording there. He, he did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth. Well, we know that when all the lies were being said, Jesus opened not his mouth. That was a huge part of, of what he was going through. And um, But there was no guile. There was no sin against his the people that were doing something to him wrongfully, nor was their guile working within him. Okay, now I know that there are some people who have learned to um, uh, take things uh, and know that that person's wrong, and of course there's some justification because they're wrong and I'm right and I didn't do anything wrong and they're evil, but there's no guile in Jesus, see? So that person has not ever suffered and fellowship with Jesus in his sufferings, okay? As long as there's guile, you know, then, you know. So, um, uh, who did no sin, neither was guile found in his mouth, okay? Who, when he was reviled, refiled not again, okay? When was he reviled? Well, I mean, the main part is through these sufferings of Christ. When he suffered, he threatened not, but committed himself to him that judgeth righteously, who his own self bore our sins in his own body on the tree. Now he talks about the tree. But then that we, being dead to sin, should live unto righteousness. Now, the word righteousness or suffering for righteousness is a different definition in Peter, okay? By whose stripes you were healed, okay? So, so he's saying, he, who did all this, he, okay, so he, he bore our sins on the tree, um, and being uh, dead to sins, this sounds like Paul, we should live under righteousness, by whose stripes we are healed. This is, this is um, the, the, ending line of what he's trying to get across and he's saying jesus did all this all this stuff but he suffered when they beat him and it's by those stripes that we'll be healed oh what maybe this is the healing of the soul maybe this is the healing by i know you know i know physically jesus bore those stripes and so therefore we're all healed i Personally, I don't believe that, that that's trying to be what it says here because the next words are this. For ye were as sheep going astray, but now are you turned again to the shepherd and bishop of your soul. Jesus dying on the cross for our sins um, and we being dead to sins live unrighteousness. That doesn't fix your soul. The salvation of your soul is directly, directly over and over and over again, directly related to when you enter. And again, we, we'd say anytime someone said something bad about me, that's the sufferings of Christ. No, no, no. We'll get into it more clearly because there's a whole book left. But that's what we say, you know, so then we just... We just apply it to this. No, there's a specific time that you're not, you're not involved in this thing. You're fellowshipping with Jesus in his sufferings. Okay? That has to be understood. Okay. So, um, by whose stripes you were healed, because he bore this, and, um, and he took it patiently, and uh, he... Uh, we're called to this. Christ also suffered, leaving us an example that we should follow, who's no guile, da 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 da, by whose stripes. When you can handle all those stripes, not just the physical thing, all of that, you can handle it in the Spirit of Christ, in the, in the particular category of the sufferings of Christ, 
then you have you have brought glory to the Lord. This is the way Paul de, uh, Peter describes it. Then he's glorified. He gets glory. All right. So now just a little. I don't know. I feel like a. Yeah, we're we're getting close to stopping here. All right. So now I'm just going to read. Uh, um, a few little things that I wrote here. For Peter, it was not merely a Christian failure. Uh, I failed to be a Christian. I failed my Christian duty. No, no. This is being one that is with him in his sufferings and in the spirit in which he suffers. Okay? Okay. He later saw it as he failed letting the lamb come out the way Jesus did for him. Letting the lamb come out. This failure was, he failed to let the lamb come out the way Jesus did for him. For you, you see your calling, leaving us an example. Peter saw the example as it were. And he he uh, he saw his failure as he saw it as that he failed letting the lamb come out the way Jesus did for him. He understood that what worked in the lamb at his highest point was meant to work in him. It would be the greatest struggle of his life if successful, the greatest victory of his life, and would be the greatest glory if he went pass through it in the spirit of the Lamb. It would not be Christian persecution. That would be about Peter. That would be about how he lives and uh, his stand as a, as a Christian, if you will. But the other, which what Peter's talking about, but the other is the sufferings of Christ. That's what he would experience, and by Christ in him, that's what the Father would give. All righty, there it is. Shall we pray? Father, I, I realize that uh, for months and months and months now, you've just thrown me into first peter and lord you've just branded it into me but i know that my seeing it and my sharing it doesn't make it real yet doesn't even make it plain yet until we get into the word of god until we hear from peter who experienced all of that and realize that his big, big failure was that Jesus was in a place of suffering and he rebuked Jesus or denied Jesus or in all the other examples that the student's father gave of Peter throughout the scriptures. There we find again and again and again. we find a, a similar line. So, Father, that your Spirit may be upon us. May, may your Spirit be upon this Word that was shared tonight. May your Spirit be upon, not just, because it's not just found in First Peter, but to see it there from the writer of that book. And there, may we be awakened to a whole new area of relating to you, not just the power of your resurrection or the being made conformable to your death, like Paul writes, but also what Paul wrote, to fellowship with you in your sufferings. Oh, Father that we may fellowship with your Son in these ways, that we may truly not deceive ourselves, but truly gain the spirit of what these things are trying to impart. Not just 
figure out the theology and the words and the doctrine and and then deceive ourselves into thinking we've got something we don't. We want you, Jesus. And we want fellowship on a level that we may have never really had before. And Father, I, I pray for those nuances of differences that Peter writes about that are not, not what Paul is saying will be highlighted and brought to our attention by your Spirit. Father, I will also add that I still from day one feel inadequate to share. I ask for your Spirit to be upon me for their sake, for those who listen to this, who watch this, who are in the classes, for their sake. May your Spirit open the heart of Jesus and open our heart to match him there in the times of his suffering. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.